What do steak fat, olive oil, and plasma membranes all have in common? Answer, they're made almost entirely out of lipids. Lipids are one of four classes of biological macromolecule that are essential for all living things. Today, we're gonna to talk about lipids. We're gonna talk about what they look like, how they're made, and the things that they do for biological systems. So stay tuned. Hi, and thanks for tuning in. Today we're talking about lipids. Now lipids are one of four major classes of biological macromolecule. Hopefully you remember from a previous video of mine, we talked about the four major classes of biological macromolecules, lipids, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and proteins. If you haven't had a chance to check out that video yet, please use this link. Now, lipids, like all other biological macromolecules, are created through a process known as dehydration synthesis, also known as a condensation reaction. This process is mediated by a group of specialized proteins called enzymes that allow, uh, that allow the, the components of a lipid or any other biological macromolecule to combine uh, to form the macromolecule while releasing water. Conversely, if we're going to break down a lipid, just like every other biological macromolecule, we're going to use a group of enzymes that are going to perform a reaction called a hydrolysis reaction. In a sense, we're going to re-add that water back in, breaking the larger biological macromolecule into smaller components. Now, for many of these biological macromolecules, i.e. anything other than lipids, those component molecules are known as monomers. But lipids are unique. Lipids are not considered polymers. They don't consist cheaply, chiefly of, re, of repeating subunits known as monomers. There is no monomer for a lipid. With the other three classes, carbohydrates, nucleic acids, and proteins, we will be talking about their monomeric subunits, but not in the case of lipids. Now, while they are unique in the sense they do not have these monomeric subunits, that also means that lipids have an incredibly diverse set of shapes and sizes and functions because they're not based on those repeating subunits. And today, we're gonna to talk about all the things that lipids do for us, what they look like and how they function. So the first major role that lipids play in biological systems is a structural role. If we look at the plasma membrane of bacteria or eukaryotic cells, what you'll see is a lipid bilayer that consists almost entirely of a type of lipid known as a phospholipid. Phospholipids are incredibly fascinating molecules. They are what are known as being an amphipathic molecule. That means that they have part of the molecule which is hydrophobic and another part of the molecule which is hydrophilic. And that dictates the way phospholipids behave in biological systems. Now remember, all biological systems exist in what we call an aqueous environment. In other words, the solvent that which all biological activities occur in is water-based. What that means is when phospholipids are made, part of the molecule this long, greasy, fatty acid tail really doesn't like water. It's hydrophobic and wants to do whatever it can to get away from it. On the other hand, this phosphate group, which has a charge associated with it, is polar. It is hydrophilic. It likes to be in water. Now, if you imagine a plasma membrane as a barrier that separates two aqueous environments, what's going to happen when these phospholipids are made is those hydrophobic tails are going to cluster together. They're going to try to basically dissolve one another and exclude themselves from water. But on both sides of that, what you're going to have is an aqueous environment. Now, when these phospholipids get together, depending on how they do so, they can lead into something called a micelle or a phospholipid bilayer. If they form a ball where all the greasy hydrophobic tails cluster in the middle and the, and the phospholipid, uh, the charged phosphate groups on the outside are facing outward, that ball is called a micelle. But in most biological systems, what ends up happening is these phospholipids stack in a way where the where they form a bilayer where the charged phosphate groups the hydrophilic portions face outward into the extracellular space or into the aqueous cytoplasm with the greasy hydrophobic fatty acid tails interacting in the middle what's really awesome about this is this particular phospholipid bilayer provides a uh, a, a strong barrier to prevent things from going inside and out of the cell it's what we call selectively permeable 
only very small hydrophobic things, things like oxygen and carbon dioxide, are able to pass freely across biological membranes. Almost everything else is excluded and requires some sort of dedicated process to bring it inside or outside of the cell. That's a process known as transport, and we'll talk about that in another video. Let's look at another lipid that we often find in biological membranes, particularly in those of animals. It's called cholesterol. Now note how structurally different cholesterol is from phospholipids. This is not an amphipathic molecule. In fact, cholesterol is almost exclusively hydrophobic. It does not really like water at all. Now the role of cholesterol in biological membranes is kind of simple. It helps to sort of reinforce the structure of the plasma membrane. At really cold temperatures, cholesterol helps keep the membrane from freezing and being too rigid and allows things to continue to move throughout that plasma membrane. In warmer environments, it actually stabilizes the phospholipid bilayer and prevents it from falling apart and essentially melting away. So cholesterol is an important molecule for all animal cells. However, also remember that it is hydrophobic. So what happens when cholesterol is produced and needs to circulate throughout the body? Well, it needs to be carried. It needs to be carried by a specific type of protein. And there are three major classes of protein which helps carry cholesterol around the body. In humans, those are known as HDL, or high-density lipoproteins, LDL, or low-density lipoproteins, and VLDL, very low-density lipoproteins. But quite often, HDL and LDL are referred to as good cholesterol and bad cholesterol, respectively. But to be clear, HDL and LDL are not cholesterol at all. Rather, they are the things that move cholesterol throughout the bloodstream. Why is HDL referred to as good cholesterol? Well, it's simple. HDL is called good cholesterol because when HDL levels are high, HDL it has the job of bringing cholesterol from the body tissues to the liver where it gets removed from the body. So in a sense, it keeps cholesterol levels low. LDLs and VLDLs do the opposite. They bring cholesterol to the tissues. And the problem is if your LDLs and VLDLs are too high, that indicates that there's too much cholesterol making it into your tissues. Why is that a problem? Well, remember, cholesterol is hydrophobic. And if you overwhelm that transport system and there's too much cholesterol, even attached to low density and very low density lipoproteins in the bloodstream, eventually some of that cholesterol is going to fall out of solution. And then it begins to cake into your arteries. It cakes into the blood vessels. And you build up what are called cholesterol plaques. This slowly squeezes the diameter of your blood vessels until they can become almost completely occluded. And this is what causes several, car several types of cardiovascular injury. So for example, heart attacks or strokes are the result quite often of this increased cholesterol. One of the earliest signs and symptoms of that, high blood pressure. Think about it, you've gotta get the same amount of blood volume through a smaller passage. What's gonna happen? You're gonna end up with a higher blood pressure. Another important role for lipids in living systems is communication. In multicellular animals, multicellular organisms in general, there is a need for the body as a whole to coordinate the activity of often trillions of different cells. For example, in humans, we have a system called an endocrine system, and an endocrine system consists of a series of glands that secrete hormones that help to tell the body when it's, for example, time to grow or decide when it's time to consume energy or break down energy and when it's time to store energy. A subset of these hormones are known as steroid hormones and steroid hormones are almost exclusively lipid based. A couple of great examples of this are testosterone and estradiol. These act to respectively masculinize and feminize the body during development. These are, and you can see these structures look very very similar to cholesterol. Why? They're all considered to be steroids. You note the multi-ring structure which is hydrophobic in nature. And as you'd expect, these particular hormones must also be carried throughout the body but are fairly readily absorbed by cells and attached to receptors that dictate the way those particular cells behave. Another great example of a steroid hormone is cortisol. Cortisol is a particularly interesting hormone. It typically gets released under stressful conditions. So under stressful conditions, cortisol gets released. And one thing cortisol does is it helps to 
reduce the inflammatory response of your body. Now you might be wondering why we'd want to reduce infl inflammatory responses because inflammatory responses are an important aspect of your immune system. Well, the answer is simple. We don't want too much inflammation. It can damage tissues and cause chronic problems within the body. So when cortisol levels are high, that tends to break down or back down the immune response. This is why cortisol is actually used quite often pharmaceutically. You know it better as hydrocortisone. You might use this if you have mosquito bites to prevent itching or if you've gotten poison ivy uh, to make the rash uh, to be less worse or reduce the itching. But there's a downside to this because cortisol has lots of effects on the body. And if you're under chronically stressed conditions, this means that your immune system may not be working as strong as it ought to because there's too much cortisol. In the end, this could actually make you much more susceptible to infections, which might explain why when people are chronically stressed, they tend to get sick a little bit more often. It also impacts the way our body responds dietarily. So for example, Increases in cortisol levels also tend to trigger increases in glucose levels, which could provide a link between why people who are chronically stressed can, uh, why chronic stress can lead to things like obesity and a higher propensity for developing diabetes. Lipids are also a tremendous source of energy. And the main reason why is lipids often contain lots of different chemical bonds in a relatively simple molecule. Why is that important? Well. Chemical bonds represent a type of energy known as chemical energy, which is a form of potential energy. And when those bonds are broken enzymatically, the energy that is released from breaking those bonds can be harnessed by enzymes to do things like cellular work. So why are lipids such a good source of energy? Well, because they contain so many bonds in such a small package, they're calorically dense which makes them very useful. In fact, they're a great way for biological systems to store energy because for a very little, in a very little small package, they can pack a lot of energy to be stored for a later date. This is actually very, very common for warm-blooded organisms such as birds and mammals. In fact, birds and mammals store a tremendous portion of their energy in what's known as adipose tissue or fatty fat tissue. These are basically cells that consist of Nothing but fat deposits that can be mobilized later when the animal needs energy. There's also an added benefit in those endothermic animals, those warm-blooded animals. Fat also provides a great source of insulation. Remember, warm-blooded animals always want to keep their body temperature in a very narrow range. For example, if you're a human, that's 98.6 degrees Fahrenheit on average. By storing energy in the form of fat, you provide an added layer of insulation to help keep the body at a relatively stable temperature. Combined, this explains why it's often difficult to get rid of fat. You may have heard that you have to work out for 20 to 30 minutes before your body's willing to break down fat at all. And the answer is yes. The reason for that is because your body would rather use other forms of energy, things like carbohydrate stores, for example, first, because they don't have the added benefit of being very economic as well as providing both padding and, and thermal insulation. So you do have to work out a little bit harder before your body's willing to start dipping into its fat reserves. When it does so, it can quite simply mobilize those fat reserves, use enzymes to perform hydrolysis reactions to break down those fatty acids, and then use the energy from those chemical bonds to produce things like ATP and perform other types of cellular work. So today was all about lipids. Uh, today we talked about how lipids are made. They're made through the same types of reactions that all biological macromolecules are made. Dehydration synthesis. They're also broken down the same way through hydrolysis. They also perform lots of different functions in the cell. They are signaling molecules, things like hormones, for example. They are structural by providing the basic molecules that make biological membranes, whether it's a plasma membrane or an organellar membrane like that found in the mitochondria or the chloroplasts. But they also provide a source of energy for many different living organisms because they contain so many uh, number, such a large number of chemical bonds in a very small package. Big thing to remember, lipids, unlike the other three biological molecules we'll be talking about, are not polymers. Uh, they do not consist of a repeating subunit known as a monomer, so keep that in mind. That's all for now, and thanks for tuning in, and I look forward to seeing you guys soon.